good to, it, I'm so excited about what's happening here. Are you excited about what's happening around here? We were up 30% last week in terms of our worship attendance because of the three services. That is very exciting. That's very exciting. And we want to celebrate what God doing, and we want to be part of that wave because we know that God loves people. God wants to help people. God wants to draw people to God's self. And God wants to bring us into a better, more full life. And so all of this, you know, the new music, the new band, we're so grateful for them and what they're doing and uh, their service. They, all, all those guys, they love the Lord. And uh, it's really wonderful to have them as new partners in ministry. And then our traditional service at 1045. And then our five o'clock, we, we had about 60 people downstairs, what we're calling the downstairs, in our uh, very casual coffee shop, kind of club-like feel down. So if you haven't been down there, go check it out. Uh, but a lot of good things happening. Celebrate Recovery got off to a fabulous start. We had about 30 or so people, 35 or something like that. And uh, over in the Fellowship Hall, that's now every Friday night. Along with everything else that's going on with the men, the women, the youth, the children. Um, uh, Gwen is doing an amazing job. There were 26 kids here last week when we started Sunday school first time in months. And uh, we went from very few kids to 26 last week. So a lot of things to be encouraged about. And as I keep saying, it, it's our job, it's your job, it's all of our job to be that living invitation to our friends, our neighbors. Be thinking about people that God wants you to invite. Because where there's space around you, just imagine your neighbor, another family member, another person. You know, we, that's the beauty of having some extra room in here. We've got room for growth. And so let's don't just think about what we're receiving and what we're getting from God, but let's be that gift that gives the gifts that we receive to those around us. There's people all around us who need the love of God, the transforming power of God. You know, one of the things I love about this church is you all love, not only do you love God and Jesus, but you love the Word of God. There's a really wonderful tradition in this church, rich tradition, of wanting to know what the Bible teaches, uh, and also then, what does that mean for our lives? And this series that we're in right now, this is week two of an eight-part series called Life's Healing Choices. And the thing about this series that you need to know, just like everything else we've done since I've been here, is this is all based on God's Word. In fact, um, this whole series is based on Jesus' teaching at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, that first portion where he gives what's, called, he, what's been called, he didn't call it this, but we call it, scholars call this, the Beatitudes. Because these are attitudes we take on as we open ourselves to God, just as Jesus opened himself to the Father. And he modeled that openness to the Father, that willingness to be whatever the Father, the Heavenly Father wanted of him. That's what G Jesus said, I only do that which the Father calls me to do. And so Jesus said, if you want to experience the kingdom of heaven, if you want to experience the riches of God, you have to understand these things. And last week, we looked at the first beatitude. And here it is on the screens. This is the first one. This is the entry point for us if we hope to experience the riches of God. Let's, let's say this together. You ready? Let's say it together. Ready? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You didn't say that very enthusiastically. Come on, you can do better than that. Ready? Let's say it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, last week we talked about the key to this, the key to entry into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, God's Son says, is poverty of spirit. You remember how we defined poverty of spirit last week? It's when we recognize our need for God. When we recognize we have a desperate need for God. And, and that's why the first choice in the, the series of healing choices that are directly related to these Beatitudes is called the reality choice. We have to get real with ourselves about the reality of our condition apart from God, that we have this great need for God. The problem is we tend to be in denial about th that we need God. We, we tend to believe the world that says we're doing fine if we just control our reality and we make our reality what we want it to be. That's what's called our sin nature. 
We're good at that. But the problem is our sin nature gets us in lots of trouble. When we're in control and we're leading ourselves, we lead ourselves to places we don't even want to be. And we hurt people we love. And so what we have to do is we have to admit that we are powerless to control our tendency to do wrong. Even though we don't want to do wrong, we do it anyway. So we have to admit. That's what poverty of spirit is. Poverty of spirit is recognizing we have a desperate need for God, that left to ourselves, we're powerless to control these urges that rise up from within us, these, these passions that are not healthy, that we wonder, why am I doing this again? Why am I back in this hole again? Why did I hurt this person I love again? Why am I holding on to anger? Why am I holding on to bitterness? Why am I doing these things that are hurting me and people I love? And that's the point. We have, this is why poverty of spirit, as Jesus said, it's the entry point to experience the goodness of God. We have to admit, we have to come clean. We have to get through our denial, our resistance to the fact that admitting the fact that we are powerless, left to ourselves, and when we're left to ourselves, our lives are unmanageable. And so with that in mind, I want, I want um, to read for you another passage. This is one we looked at last week about this first reality choice. And it's the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. We talked about this in Celebrate Recovery last week. We had a testimony where the person giving the testimony said this is what he had to face. The Apostle Paul put it like this. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do. I have the desire to do good, but I can't carry it out. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Now, what we have to realize is Paul was, he's probably one of the most famous, well-known, greatest Christians of all, greatest servants of Jesus. He wrote most, a good part of the New Testament. He was a lover of God, and yet late in his life, he made this admission. Just exactly what he's saying here is exactly what we're admitting in our reality choice. That's why it's the entry point. We can't receive help from God until we come clean and face the fact that we desperately need God. Just as Jesus said, that's poverty of spirit. So that's where we start. Now, something happens when I get in touch with this reality that left to myself, my own abilities, my own tendency to control my reality and the people around me, which we all have a natural tendency to do. We know humanly what we want for our life. We know humanly what we want for other people's lives. It's our natural tendency left to ourselves to want to control our reality and others' reality. But see, that's what leads to insanity, where we're hurting ourselves, and we just keep doing it. We just keep thinking, well, if I try harder, I'll get it right next time. And all we do is we just dig a deeper hole when we live that way. And and as we come clean like the Apostle Paul did in this passage in Romans, this admission, this confession, what happens when we face the reality we can't, through our own abilities, fix ourselves or others? Something happens. We begin to experience loss. When we face the reality, the truth, that left to ourselves, we are lost. And that's what the essence of our faith, Christian faith, is about. That we, apart from Christ and the work of Christ on the cross and the resurrection of Christ, we are lost. And if you're sitting here thinking, I'm not lost. I'm doing pretty well. I believe in Jesus, but you know what? I, I'm doing pretty darn well in my life. I think I've got control over things. You know what? You're still in denial. And I, I've told my story how I was a Christian. I was a professional Christian. I was a pastor for years, and that was where I was at. I believed in Jesus. I could say in a general sense I was a sinner, but I wasn't really in touch with the deeper reality of what went on inside of me that God saw. And one day God said, I want to show you the reality of what I see. And when I let God open me up and show me that, I began to experience grief. There's a verse in the Bible that says, godly sorrow leads to repentance. 
The only thing that will move us to genuine repentance where we put ourselves in God's hand and we give God freedom to do in our life what only God can do, transform us, heal us, lead us to better places, give us heaven on earth, all the things we want, is when we let God show us what God sees that's inside of us that left to ourselves we just don't see. In fact, we often just don't want to see it. And that's what denial, we just defend we avoid, we minimize, we pretend, we play the game, even as believers in Jesus, and we miss the kingdom of heaven. So as we come clean, as we let God open us up, as we take this first step, make this first choice, we take on poverty of spirit, we begin to mourn, we feel loss, we feel grief, godly sorrow that leads to genuine heartfelt repentance. That is what Jesus can work with. That is a life that God can change. We have to have brokenness of heart. I'm just quoting scripture here. And again, that's why I started by saying, I'm so glad you love the Bible, because all I'm doing is quoting the Bible. These are the truths of God. These are not the truths of anyone other than the heart of God that Jesus expressed when he walked the earth. So godly sorrow, when I feel my sin, the depth of what's inside of me, the way God sees it and feels it, that leads to actually turning my life over to God in new ways so God can transform me. And, and that's why the second beatitude goes like this. It's a natural progression. Blessed are those who mourn. See, that's the mourning we're talking about. Mourning the reality of our lost state these holes we keep falling back into that we don't want to be in, that we don't want to repeat these patterns where we try harder and we just end up back there again and again and again and we want to get free and we just can't if we're honest with ourselves. So we mourn that and that person who mourns, who experiences godly sorrow, that's the person God can comfort. And that's why the, uh, the choice, the second choice that goes with this is, is belief. It's believing that God can give us hope. You know, I, and we're going to, that, that's how the hope choice goes, related to mourning, feeling the weight of our sin, that we come to believe that God exists, that I matter to God, and that God has power to help me. You know, one of the great gifts of God, and this is going to sound funny, but it's true. I've experienced this profoundly in my life. I've shared it before. One of the greatest gifts of God is the gift of pain. Because when we experience pain, things that we would not normally choose, when God allows things into our life that are painful, it wakes us up to what's true. When we're comfortable and things are going in the way that we humanly want and we're kind of under control, nothing changes. We just kind of keep living the same way. But when pain breaks into our life, it wakes us, it, it startles us, whether it's through unexpected sickness. Some of you have experienced that, where you're, everything's going along fine, and all of a sudden, boom, cancer. Or a, love, a child is injured that you love. Something happens, something breaks into your life that you can't control, and you realize, I can't control this. In that pain, it makes us step back. You know, one of the greatest gifts I have as a pastor is being in the midst of family at the time when somebody's going through difficult pain and loss. You know, recently I was leading a memorial service, and I got to be with three adult children who, were, who had not gotten along, they had never reconciled their relationships. They had never worked out things. They'd somehow managed to just avoid it. And then when their, their mom was nearing death, it was really their mom's prayer. It was her longing, and I'd heard this from her heart for years. I so want my adult children to reconcile with each other, but they just won't. They just keep living in these separate relationships. And when she was nearing death, what it did is it drew those three adult, you know, 50, 60 something age children. You know, it's amazing how we can just go through life and live with this stuff. 
And the, the pain of what was happening with the, the, the impending death of their mother, and they all came from different places, and I got to sit with them, and I got to listen to them, and, and I, I was able to encourage them to be open to, you know, what do you sense happening here? And some amazing things happened. The pain of that broke through, and they began to have honest conversations about things they needed to talk about. And by the time their mom died, and by the time we were at the memorial service, they came up to me and they said, what's happened between us has been miraculous. We've had conversations we've needed to have for years, and we've worked things out in ways we just weren't able to before. And as we celebrate our mom's life, we're going to have a different kind of relationship from now on. From now on. You know, and that would not have happened if something hadn't broken in, like the loss, the impending loss of their mother. And, and sadly, that's often true for us. Listen to, to how C.S. Lewis puts this, the gift of pain. He says, and then the writer, John Baker, of our book, he writes, pain is God's antidote for our denial. You see, we're in, we just kind of go on like things are okay when it's really not because we're in denial. We're just either not seeing it or we're avoiding it or we're just kind of pretending like it's okay when there's these things that are broken in us that God wants to get out and help us with and heal and free us of. And pain gets it. It opens us up. And C.S. Lewis, one of the great writers, he writes this. And you may have heard this before. I love this quote. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures speaks to us in our conscience, but God shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. We're often deaf to the voice of God, and that's where the pain often does break us open, and that's what we're talking about here when we start to feel the weight of the reality of what's true in us, and we see it as God does, we mourn, and it opens us up. So when we're in pain, what does it do? It causes us to look to God. And I could tell you lots of stories. I could tell you stories about things I'm dealing with right now with my adult children that are, cause me pain. But what does it do? It causes me to look past the circumstance because I can't control my child if they're making bad choices in their 20s. I can't help them if I try to micromanage them, if I try to control them. See, that's what we naturally do in our sin sickness. And what it does when I'm in pain, it causes me to look past that to God, to cry out to God and say, God, help me, hear you. What is it you want of me in this circumstance, in this moment? God, that's all I can control is I can listen to you and I can respond to you. I can say yes to you. I can let your peace settle over my heart so I'm led by you. I can express grace and love, not anxiety and fear that just makes it worse, which is what I'm prone to when I allow that to grab me, even now. You know, I'm very vulnerable to that because when it involves my kids, I'm, that's the most vulnerable thing for me. I love my kids more than anything in the world. And so I have to... I have to face that pain, and let God meet me in that place. So based on this choice, and we're calling this the hope choice. So we had the reality choice. We have to face our denial, our powerlessness, the unmanageability of our life left to ourselves. We have to have poverty of spirit. Now this second beatitude, we earnestly believe that God exists. I'm not going to ask for hands, but how many, I'm not, just in your mind, your heart, do you believe in God? You know, most people believe in God. But sadly, in our world, most people don't believe in, in a loving, personal, intimate God that's speaking to them every moment of every day, that wants to be in everything in our lives. Most people believe in what you might call more the watchmaker model of God, that God's the creator. It's this power out there that kind of put everything in motion. But then we're kind of left to ourselves, and we have to manage our lives. You know, there's Christians that there's even a saying that some people think that's in the Bible, that goes like this, God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that? Ever heard that? Have you ever lived that? I have. I still do. That's my natural tendency. That's my default mode. Help myself. Do it myself. 
and I just leave God behind. You see, we not only have to believe that God exists in a general cosmic sense, but it's the second part of this that gets hard for us. The second part is I have to believe that I matter to God, that God loves me. And depending on your experience growing up, we are impacted by our environment. And so some of you may have been raised by parents who loved you unconditionally. If you did, you were blessed. You were blessed. You were incredibly blessed. If you had, if you were raised by parents who were forgiving, gracious, that they weren't controlling, that it wasn't about them, it wasn't about their agenda, it wasn't about controlling you, making you into something in their image, out of their brokenness, that they experienced because of their parents. You know, the Bible says sin gets passed from one generation to another until God intervenes, until somebody wakes up and says, I, I'm desperately lost, I need God's help. Exactly what we're talking about here. But every one of us were raised by parents or a parent. And, and if you had loving parent or parents, that's wonderful. But the reality is, is every one of us were raised by human parents. And that means all of us, if we're a parent, we know, I know, I've made lots of mistakes. I've had to go to my kids and ask for their forgiveness. And that's why we have a better relationship now, because it was more about my failings than their failings. When God helped me to have poverty of spirit and begin to realize, wow, did I blow it now. I have to go to them and ask for their forgiveness. And, and so it's helped our relationship. But every one of us falls short of the glory of God. That's another powerful truth of God. And so every one of us has a tendency to define God, who God is, how God feels about me based on our earthly experience. And so that means we all, to one degree or another, have a warped view of God. We don't, we don't have the, the view of God that Jesus had of the Father. Jesus was the only human that had a perfect relationship with God because he, was, he knew the heart of God through and through. We, we don't. We're coming into that as we come to faith, as we believe that God exists, and then we believe we matter, we matter to God. You know, there's a powerful story in the New Testament and I want, to, I want to read this for us. It's, a, it's one of the stories that typifies Jesus' encounters with people, how God cares for us. And it involves a woman who had poverty of spirit. She had a brokenness of spirit. And so she came humbly. She came honestly. This is how the story goes. This is in Luke chapter 7. It says, one of the Pharisees, invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, it's really important to note that Jesus, you probably know Jesus was harder on the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all those religious people, and he was on other people. We know that. Well, what's happening here? A religious leader, a Pharisee named Simon, we learn later in the story, invites Jesus to come to his house. So what does Jesus do? He doesn't say, no, you know, you're legalistic, you're judgmental, you won't experience, you won't be, you're not open to me and the things of God that I'm bringing. So no, I'm not going to go eat with you because eating with somebody was a sign of intimacy and communion with a person, deep connection with a person. That's what eating together in the Middle Eastern culture represented. So what does Jesus do when he invites? He goes because Jesus loved everybody equally. It's an equal playing field before God. He didn't love the poor more than the powerful. He wanted everybody to understand what he had, what God had. So he's invited. He goes. And then a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. We don't know what that meant, but she was a public sinner, maybe a prostitute, something that she was doing that was in violation to the code of the Old Testament. She learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, what do you see in this woman? Poverty of spirit. She's broken. Not only that, you see her weeping. She's literally weeping over her awareness of her sin. 
She's, desperate, she's aware of her desperate need for God and God's grace and mercy in her life. She's a candidate of someone that God's talking about in Jesus that we're looking at in this series. Someone that had that poverty of spirit, that, that mournful heart. She was literally weeping at Jesus' feet. I mean, when's the last time you wept over your sin? That you felt it that way? That you felt it the way God does? When was the last time that you felt it that way? I mean, have you? Because if we begin to feel the reality and the depth of our sin the way God does, it will overwhelm us. It will drive us to God because we'll realize, I can't fix this. This woman realized, I can't fix my problem. So she comes weeping. And it says that she came with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair. And she kissed them. She poured perfume on them. She takes the posture of a slave. She bows at his feet behind Jesus, behind this circle of people reclining on the floor, which is how they ate. And she comes up behind him without saying a word. All she's doing is weeping and she's anointing Jesus. And she's basically saying in her actions, I need your help, Jesus. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, probably in his heart, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him, what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. See, that's that religious perspective that excludes and judges and is arrogant and proud and based on his own ability to perform based on the law. And he saw himself as good in God's sight. So he was in a very different place than this woman. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him, fifth, uh, owed him 500 denarii, and denarii was about the equivalent of a day's wage. So the day's wage, so that's 500 days of work. It's a lot of money. And the other, only 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Now notice, Jesus doesn't scold Simon. He doesn't judge him. He just knows what he's sensing, knows his judgment, his heart. He sees how lost Simon is in his arrogance, in his denial, in his inability to see his own need, and he just simply tells him a story. Isn't Jesus great? He's not like us. And he's not, he doesn't jump, he doesn't jump on, he just simply tells him a story. He's trying to get his attention. And Simon replies, I suppose <laughs> the one who had the bigger debt, who was forgiven. You judge correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward this woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. So here we go. We have to believe that God exists. We have to believe that we matter to God. This woman expressed her understanding that Jesus cared for her. And so she threw herself at his feet. Simon, the one who thought he was perfectly fine by himself as a religious person, missed out. And Jesus was trying to help him, but his heart was hard. He was unwilling to face his need, and so he missed the gift. I hope we don't miss the gift. And the the last thing we have to do is we have to believe that God has the power to help us. And there's one last passage I want us to read about this hope step is what, what we call it. There's a prayer the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians. It's all about what God can do in our lives. He says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him. 
the way this woman knew Jesus. So God can help you. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope. That's why it's called, the second choice is called the hope choice. Believing that God exists, that God cares for me, and that God can help me. God has the power to help me in my places where I can't help myself. The hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power, incomparably great power for those who believe. That's why we have to earnestly believe not only that God exists, that he cares for me, but that he can help me. That's, what, that's the belief we're after. That's what Paul's praying for here. He, this power that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. So I ask you, do you have poverty of spirit? Are you aware of your desperate need for God? And have you come to a place where you actually are feeling the weight of the fact that left to yourself, you are lost, you can't fix yourself, and you can't fix the things around you, the people around you that you love most, and the world around you, the things that are out of your, you can't fix that, only God can. And so we come believing, believing God cares, and believing that God actually can make a difference. The power of the resurrection is existent in us as believers. That's the gift of God. And Jennifer is going to come and pray for us now, and just invite us to pray for these things, these things that we all need in our lives today. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, what a powerful reminder that you care about us, that we matter to you. Lord, we are in the sanctuary. We're here this morning because we believe that you exist, or we want to believe you, that you exist. And we believe that you care about us. We want to believe that you care about us. And so we thank you for this reminder from the scriptures through Mike's preaching and teaching. Lord, we confess our, our great need for you, our great need for your power in our lives. Lord, so many of us are so aware of our struggles, our sin, our burdens, our grief, our fears, those things within us that lead us to do the wrong thing, to hurt those we love, that, those that we love and care for. And so, Lord, we just acknowledge our great need for you to help us. And Lord, as we, um, as we remember, Lord, the power of the resurrection is alive not just long ago, but here today, deep within us. And so, Lord, we claim your power for our lives. Lord, would you intervene into the depths of each one of our beings, into our hearts and souls? Would you, would you meet us in our place of need and show us your glory and your power, Lord, so that we would be inspired, be led, be confident to choose hope? Lord, we... we, we, we profess our faith in you, that you are bigger than anything that is in us or in the world that threatens to take us down, to overwhelm us. And so, Lord, we lean into our faith in you, our faith in Jesus Christ alive with us. And Lord, we pray that our faith, our hope wouldn't just be about us, but it would turn us to be attentive to the needs of those around us. And so, Lord, we look to you, not just for our own needs, but for our friends, our loved ones. Or we think of those um, friends, even from our congregation, who are struggling, maybe not here, because they're recovering from surgery, battling with their own health, physical or mental health struggles. Lord, we just pray for these. We pray for others. We pray for our world, Lord, that... Um, you, would us, you would use us to shine light, to spread hope, to spread your love. Lord, tra transform us a little bit more today that we would be a part of transforming the world. 
Make it so by the power of the risen Christ living within us, next to us, through us, using us together as the body of Christ here at Moore Park. Make it so, O oh God, as only you can. Power of Jesus' name. Amen. Exists, that God's real, that God's the creator, that God's out there overseeing all things, but that God is wanting to be intimately involved in every detail of our lives, your life, and that you're opening yourself to that because you realize you need God. You're not enough. I hate to break it to you. We're not enough left to ourselves. If we think we are, we're still lost. So may God help us. And if, if you need prayer for anything this morning, there'll be people up here to pray for you. If you sense that, if you feel that tug, you feel that need, if you feel that sadness over loss, over lack of control, over your inability to fix it, come and we'll be glad to pray with you. It's how we're set free. It's how we experience the power of God. We humble ourselves, open ourselves to God. And I hope as you go out that you'll experience and you'll express and you'll live out the truth of God for everybody around you. And then next time you come, you'll bring other people with you. Bring others who need the love of God. May God bless you. Go in peace. Amen.